testimonies, Lord, around the sanctuary. Oh, God, Brother Arnold, walking in, Lord. So much you've done, God, saving lives, God. Touching sick bodies, Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for the joy of knowing your nearness, God. Oh, we love you, Lord. Uh, 
the scriptures, what I, I believe that the scriptures are teaching and revealing is not necessarily good versus bad, okay, when you compare Mary and Martha in this setting, but rather good versus better, or good versus best. There are a lot of things in scripture that are set up very clearly between good and evil, okay, right and wrong. Think of David first versus Goliath, okay? David, the worshiper of Jehovah, and Goliath, the worshiper of the God of the Philistines, who's ridiculing and mocking the God of Israel. That's clearly a battle between good and evil, right and wrong. Same for Moses and Pharaoh. Okay, Moses represents Jehovah and serves him as his man, and Pharaoh has the gods of Egypt, and the Lord sets it up almost as a battle to show his power so much mightier than the gods of Egypt. That's really at the heart of it. And there are lots of things in the Bible that are like that. I don't believe this, this is one of those. Although there's a contrast, I don't believe it's between necessarily good and evil, but rather good and better, or good, in this case, best, okay? And I think it's important that we see that. When I look at the parable of the, and that is a parable of the prodigal son, okay, everybody knows that parable, right? The prodigal son, he was the youngest son, and he was rebellious. There's nothing good about it, really, early on. He says, Father, I want what's coming to me now. Whatever you're going to give me when you die or when I get older, give it to me now. I want it. He took it. His father gave it to him. He went out and, and uh, left home. He's off on his own. How does he spend his money? He spends his money getting drunk, rides his living. Uh, and now he's in a, the home, a land that's far away from home. And a great famine arose in the land. And now he finds himself starving. And he's joined himself to a, a citizen of that country, feeding the pigs. And he was so hungry he would eat the pig's food. And he came to himself. Hallelujah. How many of us have come to ourselves? Amen. And he says, wait a minute. What am I doing eating the pig's food or about to? And says, my, my dad's servants have it better than this. I know what I'm going to do. Bing. The light bulb comes on. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home back to my father. And I'm not going to go back home haughty and rebellious. I've sinned. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against my father. And I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. I'm not even worthy to be called your son anymore. Would you just take me back as one of your hired servants? But the father was watching, right? The father in this parable represents our heavenly father. And the father sees him afar off and goes running to him. And he gets the words out. The son does, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me one of your servants. And the father's like, oh, I'll hear none of that. Right? I'll hear none of that. He brings him home. He hugs him. He kisses him. He brings him home. He says, Servants, I want you to bring him a robe that's clean. I want to put some, uh, you to put some clean, nice new shoes on his feet and a ring on his hand, representing that sonship. And I want to kill the fatted calf and we're going to have a party because my son that was lost is found and my son that was dead is alive. Now that's glorious. The Bible says that angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner comes back to the Lord and repents, comes and truly comes to Christ. All that is a beautiful picture. But we have an older son, okay? Older son is out in the field working in his dad's field when all this takes place. And he was unaware. He gets home after a hard day's work and says, what's, what's going on in the house? He asks one of the servants. What's all the festivities? Well, your son, your younger brother has come home and your father's killed the fatted calf and, and rejoicing. And he stands out and he's angry or he's disappointed. And I can see him sort of pouting and he's got reasons in his mind why, that, why that's the case. And his father comes out to him because he wouldn't go in the house to join in what was going on. And the father says, son, uh, what's going on? And he says, well, dad, I've served you faithfully all these years. I didn't rebel against you and take my inheritance early, but my younger brother, 
took his money early and left and spent all his money in riotous living. And now you, he comes home and you, you kill the fat of calf and have this big party. You never did that with me. So I could, for me, where I could have this big party with my friends. And the father says, son, you're always with me. You're always with me. Everything that I have is yours. And it, because it was me, it's proper that we should welcome your, your brother back this way. He was lost and is found. He was dead, and now he's alive. Now, we don't go on. The, the parable doesn't continue beyond that to see what was the reaction and response of the older brother after this happened. But my point is this. A lot of times that older brother is presented as a Pharisee and as a legalist, and he's bad and harsh and cruel, and the younger brother's good, and of course the father's good. But I don't think that's really the picture. That older brother was serving in the house. He had been faithful to his father. The father didn't disown him and say, forget you, I'm locking the door, you can't come in, because you, the, the, the father went out and gently spoke to him and taught him. The older brother, was he wrong? Absolutely. His attitude was wrong. Nobody's excusing it. The father didn't excuse it. But what the father did do was take the time to gently teach him and instruct him. And that's what we're going to see a lot of times. We, we're so quick because maybe we've seen movies and life and battles and wars and everything's just clearly right and wrong a lot of times. But even in this parable, the younger son was wrong to take the money and go. He was right to repent and come home humbly. The father was right to receive him that way with joy. The other older brother was wrong to not be joyful and to welcome his brother back and to be forgiving, okay? But the father did not disown the older brother now and say, because you were so unwelcoming to your brother, uh, that's it with you. No, he says, you're my son. Everything I have is yours already. And it was proper that we welcome your brother back. And I know it's just a parable, but I pray that the older brother said, you're right, Dad, and went in and hugged his brother's neck. My point to this is I want to look to the father for just a moment, because the father in this parable took the time to go deal with the older brother. How? Kindly and patiently. How does the Lord, we'll go back to our text about Mary and Martha on this occasion. How did the Lord deal with Martha? in this occasion, on this occasion, patiently, kindly, gently, and I want us to see that we can be wrong about things. Thank God that the Lord is patient with us and instructs us. I've been wrong on so many things in life, but guess what we do? We grow and we learn, don't we? We think we've got doctrine figured out. We think we've got life figured out. We think we're justified in acting maybe like the older brother. Uh, we think we're justified and God gets a hold of us by the Holy Ghost and by the Word of God. And He teaches us. And He changes us. And not one of us that's perfect. The younger brother wasn't perfect. The younger, older brother wasn't perfect. God the Father is perfect. And Jesus was perfect. Uh, and is. And so I'm going to get back to our, our account of Mary and Martha. Mary had chosen... The Bible says, the Lord says, that good part, to choose means to select her favorite. It was her favorite. Her favorite thing to do was to sit at the feet of Jesus. Sit at the feet of her, her Lord and Savior. She chose that good part. Good part here means well, benefit, beautiful, valuable, virtuous. She chose that. Okay, it was her choice, and she clearly made the right choice. To sit at the Lord's feet, to hear the Lord's words, nothing is more valuable than this. So think about it. There's two women. They both love the Lord. They're both friends of Jesus. They're, they're not in sin. He's in their home. One is serving and one is sitting at the feet of Jesus, hearing his words. Mary chose that good part. Her choice was the right choice. It was the right choice for the right time, for the right moment. Sometimes the Lord is teaching us not always good and evil and right and wrong. There's plenty of that in the Bible, plenty of that in our, in our life. But sometimes he's teaching us this is good 
this is better. This is good, this is best. And sometimes we miss that. Mary didn't miss it, okay? On this occasion, Mary didn't miss it, praise God. She saw, she's been sitting at the feet of the Lord. Nothing is more valuable than this. Nothing takes precedence over this. Nothing is of greater worth or benefit than this. To sit at Jesus' feet, to sit before the Lord, to wait on the Lord, to commune with the Lord, to be with Him, to draw near to Him when such an opportunity is afforded us. When that is the opportunity, that's what we should be doing. To hear His words, to listen to His voice, I would call it to soak it all in. Just to soak it all in with nothing else rattling for my attention. Just sitting before the Lord. What possibly could be a better use of our time than that? The answer is nothing. Okay? Nothing. The Bible says that uh, all of heaven, all of us of heaven waits upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. And God wants us to, to learn to wait upon Him, to sit before Him, and to soak it all in. When the Lord is present, like He is this morning with us, okay? You know what it's time to do? It's time to be in His presence. It's time to, to give ear to Him, for our spiritual eyes to be open, to give attention to Him. And when the Lord is feeding His people, that's what Jesus was doing in that home, was feeding with his word, right? When the Lord is feeding us, we need to be right there, with our mouths open. Open, open wide that mouth, and I will fill it, he says. We need to be sitting there. We need to be all in, so to speak, giving attention, attendance to the Lord. I just thank the Lord for his kindness. If in Martha's service, Martha's service to the Lord, she's the one covered about my serving, okay? Martha's service to the Lord was good. I would say it was even very good, but there was something at this moment that would have been better. Okay, her service was good to the Lord, but at this moment there was something better. Remember that word good part that Mary chose means uh, valuable, virtuous, or something more virtuous, more valuable, more beautiful than cooking and serving in the kitchen, even though she was doing it for the Lord and for his disciples, which was a good thing. Mary saw this. Mary understood this truth, and Mary chose that. Remember, she chose that. Remember, free will. That was her choice, how she was going to spend that moment and how she was going to spend that time. She stood it. Martha understood it and she chose it. Martha would come to understand it because the Lord was patient. She you could say she was wise. Mary was. And it was an opportunity to commune with the Lord uninterrupted. Uninterrupted time with the Lord. To be with Him. To hear His words of life. I'm sure that, that Mary felt some responsibility to help her sister and to serve. She still, as she waited the two, I don't know how long it took, she had the two, she chose. Okay? She chose. She chose something that was of greater value at this moment. And it was. And I want to say this morning that, again, this to me is not a picture of good versus evil, but good versus better, or good versus best. And sometimes we get plateaued off on good, and the Lord said, that's fine. That's good. There's a time for that. This is better. This is better. And that's part of growing. That's part of growing for every one of us and maturing in the Lord. Can I tell you, I'm just looking at these two women, not a parable, real people, real friends of Jesus, in their home, a real situation. Mary Martha's serving. She's working hard to serve. 
If you've ever served and gotten a big fed Christmas dinner for everybody coming, Thanksgiving dinner, everybody's coming, a fellowship in your house, and you've been working all week getting the house straight, and then all the two days before it, and the day of, and then the minutes leading up to it, and you're trying to get everything because you want it to be so nice. All right? Nothing wrong with that. There's clearly a time, as Christians, as believers, to serve, and there's clearly a time to sit at Jesus' feet. And you and I need to know the difference. What to do when? There's a time to serve, and there's a time to sit at Jesus' feet. And we need to know, what am I supposed to be doing now? What would be the best use of my time now? We see both in, in the Bible, and the Lord makes time for both. And I can say if we're actually going to serve the Lord, uh, then we need to sit at His feet and to commune with the Lord, to be filled with His Spirit, to have His mind, to have His heart. If I'm going to ever go serve the Lord, I need to be with the Lord. And then while I'm with the Lord, he might say, it's time to go serve me now. Okay? And he, we're always with the Lord, and he's always with us. I think about this. You don't have to turn here, but in, in, uh, in the book of Joshua, when the, the first big battle was what? When they crossed up the river, the first thing they see is the walled cities of Jericho, impenetrable walls. And yet they fall because the Lord does it. He set the precedence that your enemies are not going to be able to stand before you. This is the birth of many battles and many enemies. I'm showing you how I'm going to be with you. Okay? And he, he proved that. And so they went this mighty victory, but there was an, a command before they went in, right? Don't take the accursed thing. Don't, don't spoil their goods. There will be other times they could spoil the goods, but they were told not to. It's an accursed city. It's an accursed... A place and people, I don't want you touching or taking their stuff. And we know the story of Achan, one of the, one of the Hebrews that had been in there, he coveted, uh, I think, 30 pieces of silver and some Babylonian garments that he thought looked really cool. He went and hid them under his tent. No big deal, right? Well, the next day there's another battle against a smaller town, Ai. And they even said, we don't need to send all the people, just send a few men out. I didn't bother everybody to win this battle. They turned and fled before their enemies because the Lord was not with them. Because the Lord was not with them. And they, they fled, and I think it was 14 of the Hebrew soldiers died. It was needless because they didn't understand what was going on. So what is Joshua doing? He weeps. He goes to the Lord, he prays, which was the right thing to do. God, when our enemies hear about this, and there are a lot more out there, they're going to be emboldened against us. They're going to hear that we fled before our enemies. And it's not going to be good. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get up, wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. What is he saying? There was a time to pray. I know it's a different example, but it's a, there was a time to pray. Go hear from God. Joshua did that. And then he says, it's enough. It's enough. I'm telling you, get up off your face. Stop crying to me. There's a sin, and I want you to go deal with it. There's a time to sit before the Lord, and there's a time to go do what God has told us to do. We have to sit with the Lord if we're going to know his will and his word and his heart and be empowered by the Lord. And then we have to go when he tells us to go. There's clearly a time for both. There's a time to, uh, there's a time to pray and prepare a sermon or a lesson. Hear from God. Study. You go over it and you go over it and you go over it and you work on it. You kind of preach it to yourself and work on it and you get it all ready. There's a time to pray and prepare. Then there's a time to go preach it, right? You have to have that time with just you and the Lord and prepare it. Don't ever neglect that. But then there's a time that says, okay, it's Sunday morning at 1030. Go preach it. Or Sunday morning at 930 for Sunday school. Go teach it. There's a time to pray for souls to be saved and there's a time to go win them. There's a time to pray. Bring revival, make us soul winners, God. Save people in this hour. Turn our country to you through true salvation. And then there's a time to go win them to the Lord. 
There's a time to sit before the Lord and be filled with His Holy Spirit, and there's a time to go pour out. Pour out what He's imparted to you and given. And we need to know the difference. And, and so when, when, I would say this, when the Lord is speaking, when God's people are gathered together, this is where we need to be. This is just an example. If this is where and He's promised, we know it. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Then I need to be in the midst as well. I need to be, I need to be part of that. And I need to be sitting at Jesus' feet, so to speak, and being fed by him. That's, that's the time for that. And so, uh, you know, when blind Bartimaeus, he was called Bartimaeus, but he was blind. And Jesus was passing by. And Jesus did all sorts of miracles. And he had heard about this man. What's all the road? Because he couldn't see what Jesus is passing by. He starts crying out with all his might. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. They're saying, be quiet. Be quiet. Oh, you're, you're too obnoxious, Bartimaeus. He's crying out. You know why? Because it was time. That was the time to be crying out. Not five minutes later. Not an hour later the next day. He was going to be gone. Now's the time that he was to be calling upon the Lord to heal him. He didn't care what people thought. And the Lord stopped where he was and said, you tell him to come over here. What do you want, Bartimaeus? I want to see. The Lord touches him and he healed him and he saw. It was time. And we need to know the time when the Lord is saying, sit or sit at the feet of Jesus or come and, and hear or come and be healed or go. In his name, we need to know the difference. So I want to talk about this just uh, in, in the, the second part of this message or the, the latter, latter part of this message. Two reasons, I think, when, when Jesus spoke to him, two purposes, I believe, in her words to Martha. Okay? So Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. Martha is running around serving, probably working up a good sweat, and <coughs> running around, and uh, she's serving, and Mary's sitting there. And, and he rebuked her, but he did not rebuke her for serving. Let's look back at our passage there. When he says, and Jesus answered, she says in verse 30, bid my sister to come help me. Don't you care? She's left me to serve by all these people. All your disciples and you, whoever else was there by myself, don't you care? Isn't that wrong? Go ask her to come help me. And the Lord says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled. That means anxious and agitated about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen. That good part, or that was virtuous or beautiful part, which shall not be taken away from her. So the Lord does not rebuke her for serving. What does he rebuke her for? There was a kind rebuke. The Lord's kind and patient, a lot more kind than we are when we rebuke people a lot of times. He rebuked her for her fretting. He rebuked her for her anxiousness. Not because she was serving. The serving was not uh, sinful. It wasn't wrong. So what does it mean when it says Mary Mary was covered about much serving? I've been there before. Have you? Been covered about just running like a chicken with your head cut off, trying to get stuff done, trying to get stuff done, and there might be something way more valuable right here beside you. Something your children want to do at that moment. Some family devotion or something else that's of more value, value at that time. The Lord will make room for both and time for both if we walk closely to Him. But she's covered about much serving. That means covered about, and this is the only time this is used in the, in the scriptures. It means distracted. It means drawn different ways. So can you just picture her? In your, it's almost a little comical. She's drawn different ways. She's trying to get the cups cleaned out and making sure we got enough water and, and, and the food's and flipping up burgers or whatever. And uh, she, it means overcharged with cares. It literally means to drag around with cares. So Martha's just being drug around with cares. But he doesn't rebuke her for serving. He rebukes her for her anxiousness and her fretting. 
You're careful about many things. That means you're anxious, you're worried, you're troubled. The Bible tells us that we're to cast all of our cares upon the Lord because he cares for us. Has he had to teach you that more than once? He has to teach that to me, to me every day, every single day. <clears throat> he's patient, he's kind. This is not Mary and Martha good versus bad. This is two people that he loves. This one's getting it right now and understands this one doesn't quite get. He's gonna show her, he's gonna teach her. Thank God, that, that is how he is with us, with his children. But we're told in the Bible to be careful for nothing but to cast our cares upon the Lord. We're told to fret not thyself. We're told uh, to take no thought for tomorrow, but to seek first the kingdom of God. We're tra told to trust in the Lord, to wait on him to bring it to pass, to rest in him. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. This is what we're taught, and this is what he was teaching her right now. Because you know what cares of this life? Mary wasn't sinning. Martha wasn't sinning. And we're not in all the scriptures that we just quoted about casting our cares and so forth. They're not dealing with sins. They're dealing with cares. Cares. You know what cares of this life can do? They can drag us all around. I'd like to see someone here that has not been drug around by the cares of this life. Absolutely. Our, our cares of this life, just basic life things, needs, responsibilities. Are Christians supposed to be responsible? Yes. Are we supposed to work and provide for our families? Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Are we to be anxious about any of it? No. No, we're not. And so if a rebuke comes, it's not because we're serving the Lord or serving our household or whatever it may be. The rebuke comes that we're anxious, that we're fretting, and I can tell you that cares of this life can consume us. And when cares of this life, not sinful things, in and of themselves, they can rob our peace. They can rob our joy. They can overtake our thoughts and our time. They can cloud our spiritual vision and sight. We're not seeing clearly. I'm still a child of God, but I'm not seeing this clearly because I don't, I don't know if I'm coming or going. I'm so busy. I'm so... Uh, carried about by these cares. They can rob our time and they can take our eyes off of the Lord. Worldly cares can rob us of so much of the peace of God that he wants us to have. Now in the parable of the seed and the sower, I think it's in three of the four gospels, one of the biggest parables, if you want to call it that, he spends the most time, most verses on this parable. And the cares of this world, he says, and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. None of those were necessarily, well, not all of it was sinful. It says the cares of this world. It says and a lust for other things enter in. Where do they enter into the life, into the heart, into the mind? And they take on the life of their own and importance and they start steering the ship from our pursuit of these things. And it says that the word is choked out. What is the word? It's all the promises of God, the truth of the Lord, that he's saying, thus saith the Lord, and live by this, you know, live by this word. But that just got choked out. Not because I'm caring for my family, but because I'm fretting and anxious. And these cares have taken uh, precedence in my life and the word that God speaks to us becomes unfruitful God doesn't want that so if there's a rebuke to Martha and her serving but not because she was serving she was serving the Lord remember that and his disciples it was the rebuke was that she was fretting okay you are careful for many things secondly I believe the words of the Lord serve to teach Martha what we've been talking about. To teach her and instruct her what evidently Mary already knew. Why she knew it, I don't know. Why do some people get things and others don't spiritually? Uh, we're all going to end up in the same place if we keep our eyes on Jesus. Okay, somebody might get something 
before you or after you and come to that understanding. So his words served to teach and instruct Martha about what was most valuable. Most valuable. Number one, he rebuked her for fretting. Number two, he, rebuked, he instructs her about something that is more valuable. Her serving was not wrong, but there is something better, and I would say far better. Guess what? She was missing it. She was missing out on it. And that moment and that opportunity was not going to last forever. In the midst of all of her being covered about with serving, she was missing it. And the Lord would say to us this morning, in the midst of your serving, even serving the Lord, even serving the Lord and, and service that you do regularly for the Lord, don't miss out on the best. Don't miss out on the Lord and His presence. As I've said, in God's government, if you want to call it that, it's not always a matter of right and wrong. It's a lot of times it is. But sometimes it's a matter of good versus best. I'll give an example. Those We have a lot of family people here, and families with children and young children. If a dad's going to go take off from work or something he's doing around the house, and he's going to go spend that time with the kids, throwing the ball with the kids or whatever, go swimming with the kids. That is a good thing. But if that's 10.30 on a Sunday morning, guess what? There's something better. How about worshiping with your children? That's better. Both are good, and the Lord will make time for both of those if we walk with them and you know, stay in His will. I know that's just a, 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 an example, but God's going to make time for that. There's At the moment that Jesus was in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, there was something better the service could have waited just a little longer and take advantage of this opportunity. You don't have this every day. Where the, the word made flesh is sitting in your home. You don't have that every day like that. And so the Lord was teaching her. He was showing her. And there's different... Uh, I know I've taught on the, the Mary. There's two occasions that the women anointed Jesus' head with the oil. There's actually two different occasions. And wiped his feet with their hair and washed them with the tears. And it's believed that one of these was Mary that was doing this. But even so, uh, when Jesus was in Simon's house, Simon the leper's house, and he was eating with them, and Mary comes in, and out front of all those men, and opens this alabaster box of very expensive perfume, and he pours it on the Lord's head. She pours it on the Lord's head, and she's literally worshiping at his feet, literally crying at his feet. And they're just sitting there, how's the weather, you know, and talking about whatever they're talking about. Mary got it, so to speak. And the people that were sitting there got actually bent out of shape. It wasn't just one. They said, why wasn't this perfume? Why the waste of that perfume? I did a study on that before. It was like a year's worth of wages. You take a year's worth of your wages and go pour it on Jesus. And they said, when there's something more valuable, couldn't we have taken that, sold it, given it to the poor? Giving to the poor is a good thing, isn't it? It's biblical, scriptural, shows the love of the Lord. We do it in his name as he enables us to do, as he leads us to do. It's a good thing, a biblical thing. There was something far better at that time. A better use of that oil. Jesus said, for you have the poor always with you. He said, you can do good to them anytime you want to do it. But me, you have not always. Leave her alone. Let her alone, he said. And I just think about it. Giving to the poor is good. It's Christian. Biblical. Shows it's a witness for Christ. Shows the compassion of the Lord. We're absolutely to give to the poor. Again, as the Lord enables and directs us. There was something better far better at this moment. 
best use possible for that expensive ointment, perfume. I'm going to put it right here. We need to know the difference between the good and the best. And Jesus says, Mary, Martha, I'm sorry, one thing is needful. That means necessary. There's a demand. It means a requirement. It means an occasion. There's one thing that is more needful, Martha. And Mary had chosen that best part, that good part. Okay? It was better. Occupation, being occupied with Christ himself, is the best. The best use of our time, our lives, our energy, our money. There's nothing better than that. He said that it's not going to be taken away from her. Mary chose, made the right choice. She chose that good part, more virtuous, more valuable, more beautiful. And it's not going to be taken away from her. I gather from that there was eternal value in what she was doing. She was blessed because Mary was blessed by sitting at the feet of Jesus. There was something given to her, imparted to her, that was not going to just disappear a few minutes later. It was not going to be taken from her. And I'm bringing this to a close. But you and I, as the redeemed of the Lord, are to be brought to such a place. It's growth. Again, I'm so thankful, and I really mean it. This part of this, this, to me, the theme of this story is the patience of the Lord. Even the parable of the prodigal son and the patience of the Lord with, with Martha. He didn't smirk at Martha. Look at her. What a buffoon. You know, she's running around serving so much. He didn't do that. He said, Martha, Martha, look. He's patient with us. He's kind with us. He deals with us. We ought to treat each other that way, too. And not say, what a yo-yo. not saying we do that. But I just think of the kindness of the Lord. Even when people have heard preachers preach about the older son in the, the parable of the, the prodigal son, he's always a butt of a joke. He's the Pharisee. Well, his father didn't treat him like a Pharisee. His father treated him like a son who wanted to teach and instruct. And he didn't treat him. Martha like a Pharisee. He treated Martha like a friend that he wanted to teach and instruct. Mary, I love you. You're missing this right here. I mean, Martha, you're missing. I'm sorry. This is what you're missing and you need to see. Do you can come on up, but oh, oh that we would come to the place in this practice of sitting at the feet of Jesus sit at the feet of the Lord, hearing his word. There are many things, many things in the Bible we can start rattling off right now that are good, that the Christian is instructed to do in life. Giving, you know, serving, sharing the gospel, gathering with the saints, whatever you go on and on, loving our neighbors, ourselves, giving to the poor, all these things, but there's, God wants to teach us the best. The best is our time with him. And everything, all that service will flow out of that. All of your service to the Lord will flow out of your time with the Lord and your communion with the Lord. It'll be effective and it'll be right and it'll be what he wanted. It's not you trying to hit miss, miss. It's serving the Lord, having been with the Lord, knowing that you're in his presence. Blessed is the man who now chooses and calls us to approach unto thee. That's the blessing. Approaching unto the Lord. He chooses us all to do that, right? Through the blood of Jesus Christ, our advocate, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. I want to read this in closing. The Master does appreciate all that we undertake for him. He knows that our first but he knows that our first need is to sit at his feet and to learn his will. Then in our service, we should be calm and peaceful and kindly. And the last, our service may attain unto the perfectness of that of Mary, when on a later occasion, she poured upon the feet of Jesus the ointment 
the perfume which still which odor still fills the world today. The odor of that perfume still fill, fills the world today. Sit, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Good, better, and best. That's the best. Amen. The sin at the feet of the Lord. I want you to stand with me this morning. I really encourage you to come to the altars. The altars are open and commune with the Lord. Take some time before the Lord. God's leading you. He's dealing with you what to pray about. Maybe you're covered about much serving. And somehow whether your communion with the Lord sitting in his feet has gotten lost in the shuffle. Maybe you do good things with your children, your spouse, your friends, but you don't do the best thing. And the Lord's leading you. He's leading me. Let's come and take this time with the Lord and meet with him. Thank you, Jesus.